Good, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And you're very, very welcome to this um, final sitting of um, tributes to our dear friend and colleague, Mr. Justice Robert Bobby Eager. I particularly want to welcome Bobby's family, Monica, uh, Katie, and Sarah, and all of his family and friends to this momentous occasion, a sad, poignant, but happy occasion. Bobby is a very dear and great friend of all of us. My only role, really, apart from welcoming people, is, is, is to set out the order of play for today and to identify the speakers, something that's not often done, and people who may be strangers to ceremonies like this often really don't know what's happening. Um, but I, I want to now introduce the speakers and, uh, uh, in, in the order in which they will speak. First of all, making his debut performance at a judicial retirement <laughs> is the freshly minted, newly appointed Attorney General, Rasa Fanning, Senior Counsel. Following the attorney will be Sarah Phelan, Senior Counsel, Chair of the Bar, uh, in her second, I think, judicial retirement so far, uh, as is uh, President Maura Derivan, President of the Law Society, who hopes to follow up her performance in the Supreme Court with another performance this morning. Um, and, then, then, and then there is Angela Denning, the Chief, Chief Executive Officer of the Court Service, followed by Chief Superintendent Patrick McMenamin, and then Caroline Murray, uh, Bobby's long-serving registrar, and then, of course, the main man himself. So, thank you very much. In his volume of memoirs entitled Truly Frank, former Irish Times environment editor Frank MacDonald gives an account of his school days in St. Vincent's Christian Brothers in Glasnevin in the early 1960s. He describes his outstanding teacher from that era, now some 60 years ago, in the following terms. Our favourite was Bob Eager, who taught us French and English. Whatever his faults as a non-native speaker in communicating French, we thought he was the best teacher ever. He gave us a love of the English language because he clearly loved it himself. Dressed in a beige tweed jacket, light waistcoat and cavalry twill trousers, with a moth-eaten black gown casually draped over the lot, he encouraged us in writing essays, discussed the hidden meanings of poems by Yeats, and led us through the works of Shakespeare or at least As You Like It for the Intercert and Hamlet for the Leaving. Bob Eager lived in Dartmouth Square and would usually either walk or cycle to work in Glasnevin as there was no direct bus route. It is almost entirely due to him that I developed the confidence to write and ultimately become a journalist. Frank MacDonald's younger brother, presently to be found sitting exactly two rows behind me, confirms this recollection from more limited interaction. And Mr. Justice Eager, he described your father to me last week as superb and as an amazing English teacher. I, I begin with this morsel of trivia because I dare say that if your father inspired his students to pursue such successful careers, he must equally have inspired yours. If Captain Robert Eager, teaching was not his only career, and your mother, Bridie Noonan, were still with us today, I have no doubt but that they would be justifiably proud of the career that you've had. Today marks the conclusion of an important phase in your professional career. Today is your last day of service as a judge of the High Court, itself the culmination of an extraordinary contribution to Irish society, by no means confined to the law. Modest and unassuming a person as you are, your contribution to Irish public life has been extensive. You have served as chair of the Dublin Simon community. You were a founder of the Irish Refugee Council, and you served on the board of the Ranla multi-denominational school. All hallmarks of your personal attributes of devotion to public service and compassion for others. But at least in these parts, it will be your long and successful career as a lawyer for which you will be best remembered. You were added to the role of solicitors now some 45 years ago in 1978. You worked in the office of the Chief State Solicitor until 1984, when you joined the firm of Garrett Sheehan and Partners, whose eponymous founder with us here this morning, you would ultimately follow onto the High Court bench, 
giving that firm the unique distinction of two of its partners being appointed as High Court judges. You practiced as a solicitor in that firm for some 30 years, 19 of them as a partner, with a varied practice in the fields of criminal law, extradition, asylum, and human rights. When you joined that firm, Garrett had already developed a reputation as a fearless criminal defense lawyer, always willing to take on clients, however challenging or unpopular the representation might be. You joined him in that vocation, and I know that from speaking with many of my colleagues at the criminal bar, a good number of whom are here to salute you this morning, that you have always been held in exceptionally high esteem by them. For you, in the very best traditions of our adversarial legal system, no cause was too hopeless or unpopular for you to take it on. A laudable personal philosophy, emphasized perhaps unintentionally by your long-term devotion to both Bohemians and Everton Football Club. <laughs> for the uninitiated here today, the division of responsibilities on the part of speakers at judicial retirement events has evolved somewhat over time. That well-known oracle of Four Courts tradition, Mr. Justice Hugh Gagan, wrote on this topic in his article on the relationship between the Attorney General and the Judiciary in a volume of essays published in honour of my distinguished late predecessor, Rory Brady. Historically, Judge Gagan wrote, the Attorney General paid tribute to the retiring judge on behalf of the Bar, and the Chair of the Bar Council would only speak if the Attorney was unavailable. But these days we both speak, and whilst others will focus on your career as a lawyer and how you have engaged with lawyers and litigants whilst a judge, matters have now evolved to the point where it is customary that I would exercise the function of thanking you on behalf of the government and on behalf of the Irish people for your judicial service. And therefore I want to focus now on the most recent phase of your career, as for more than eight years since your appointment in October 2014, you have served with distinction as a judge of this court. Let me say at once to everybody present this morning that to serve as a judge of the High Court is no ordinary accomplishment. It is, in the words of Miss Justice Finlay Gagan, a fundamental misconception to consider being a judge to be just a job. Being a judge is to be an office holder in the judicial arm of government. Being a judge of the High Court is to hold a constitutional office that, per Article 34.3.1 of Bunrocht Naharan, is invested with full original jurisdiction in and power to determine all matters and questions, whether of law or fact, civil or criminal. Judge Eager, you are just the sixth solicitor in the history of the state to have held the office of a High Court judge. Only Michael Pierce, your former partner, Garrett Sheehan, Brian McMahon, Michael White and Don Vinci were to achieve that distinction before you. And it's in that context that I say to you, Judge Eager, that it's an enormous personal honour for me to appear with the other speakers gathered here this morning to pay tribute to you on the occasion of your retirement. In the course of your judicial career, uh, your duties have been varied. In the criminal law sphere, you were the judge in bail hearings involving Lisa Smith and those accused of the murder of Anna Kriegel and the kidnapping of Kevin Lunny. In 2016, you presided over the first trial at the new Special Criminal Court sitting in Dublin, in which Ryan Glennon was found guilty of IRA membership. You were also the designated judge to report to Antishok on the operation of the Criminal Justice Surveillance Act 2009. I mentioned earlier that your contribution to public life outside of the law has marked you out as a man of compassion. Compassion has equally been a hallmark of your career as a judge, in which you've had a strong record of upholding the rights of persons who have been the victims of discrimination or sexual abuse. You decided important litigation involving an issue of gender discrimination in 2017, when a female army captain excluded from a promotions process for the position of commandant uh, due to being on maternity leave was awarded almost 825,000 euro by you in damages. You held the Captain Diane Burns exclusion was in breach of European law equality requirements. In JD and the DPP in 2017, you refused to grant the applicant an order of prohibition, restraining the DPP from prosecuting him for sexual assault after a prosecutorial delay of 18 years. That was in circumstances where there was significant new evidence that had become available. 
You held that delay was not sufficient in and of itself to justify the prohibition of a trial. And your view was that the guilt or innocence of persons accused of crime should be determined by a full trial on the merits. In the immigration field, you were always vigilant to protect the rights of the vulnerable. And in a number of cases, you quashed decisions, refusing asylum, on the basis that the decision maker acted irrationally or unreasonably in the way that they addressed the facts or evidence. To give but one example, in GH, a minor from Pakistan against the Refugee Appeals Tribunal in 2015, you considered that the respondent had acted unreasonably in finding that the applicant, who was a child and an adherent of the Ahmadi faith, would suffer religious discrimination but not persecution in light of the information on the country of origin. You considered that treatment, including verbal abuse in the street, exclusion from certain activities in school, and assault by the applicant's teachers would amount to persecution of the applicant. In considering whether the treatment in the country of origin amounted to persecution, you said that another principle is that actions which may not constitute persecution when experienced by an adult could satisfy the persecution element of the refugee definition when experienced by a child. Minor applicants are necessarily more vulnerable to the effects of torture and other forms of serious harm, in particular physical and psychological harm. And the principle of the best interests of the child requires that the harm feared upon return be assessed from the child's perspective. In the criminal law field, you delivered an important judgment on retrospective effect in Larkin and the governor of Mountjoy Prison in 2016, where the applicant initiated Article 40 proceedings, seeking his release from prison where he was serving a term of imprisonment for committing offences that led to the reactivation of a sentence that had previously been suspended. The applicant argued that as the procedure for the reactivation of suspended sentences, pursuant to Section 99 of the Criminal Justice Act of 2006, had been declared unconstitutional in Moore and the DPP, he could no longer be detained. But you held that the applicant was detained in accordance with law on the basis that the authorities did not establish that a declaration of invalidity of the two subsections had a blanket retrospective effect. That decision has been cited in numerous judgments in the High Court and has also been cited favourably in the Court of Appeal. Similarly, you delivered a very important judgment in Dooley and the DPP in 2017, where the applicants sought to quash committal warrants for their arrest and detention arising from their failure to pay fines on time. Your decision quashing the committal warrants was upheld by the Supreme Court on appeal. Another significant decision of yours was that of Curran and the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal in 2017, a case on the contribution of time, on the construction of time limits for appeal, where your approach has been cited in a number of subsequent judgments, such as Kerwin and O'Leary and Murphy and the Law Society. And that judgment has also been applied as a general authority on the construction of time limits for appeals in completely different contexts, such as insolvency and residential tenancies. Much less satisfactory was your decision in Eudori, Construction and Greeny, in which you inexplicably favoured arguments advanced by Declan McGrath over my own <laughs> in deciding to set aside an ex parte order under the Foreign Tribunal's Evidence Act of 1856, seeking to depose an Irish national to give evidence in Ireland for the purposes of civil litigation in Israel. I have to confess that that was not the only occasion in which I came out second best against that particular opponent. <laughs> and you will forgive me, Judge Eager, for making one further personal comment on this, the first occasion that I've spoken in the four courts in my new capacity. Today is the first time since his appointment to judicial office on which I have appeared before the President without any fear of him asking me difficult questions that I'll be unable to answer. An unfortunate pattern of engagement between the two of us that dates back 22 years to my devilling year. Had I not had the immense fortune of learning so much at the outset of my career, President, I'm absolutely certain I'd never have had the privilege of standing here today to pay tribute to Mr. Justice Eager. Judge Eager, today is a proud day for you, your wife Monica, your daughters Katie and Sarah, and the rest of your family. Their respective career paths in social work and studying English, um, a tribute perhaps to their grandfather, could be said in many ways to pay homage to your own career. You will be remembered by us in the legal community and by the litigants who appeared before you as a man of compassion and integrity. In recent years, you have remained stoic and resolute 
in the face of some medical challenges, and we know that you are today retiring slightly prematurely, in part to focus on those. I know that I speak for everybody present today in wishing you the very best in that regard. Judge Eager, thank you so much for your public service, and may you enjoy a long and happy retirement. Mm -hmm. President Barnevilland, members of the judiciary, Attorney General, Judge, Judge Eager's family and friends, and indeed my own colleagues and friends. I would like to say what a pleasure and honour it is for me to be invited to pay tribute to you this morning. As our Attorney General has set out, you've had a most remarkable career as a solicitor, both in the public sector and then in private practice and then for many years as a partner in that practice, and latterly for eight plus years as a judge of the High Court. Our attorney has mentioned many of the seminal cases in which you were involved, and I think rather than expand upon those cases in any more detail, um, I thought if I might comment on your relationship between the bar when you were a practicing solicitor, and indeed as a judge as well. I think it's my loss that during your tenure as a High Court judge, I think I only appeared before you once. And that was when you presided as a senior judge at the provincial sessions in Waterford in May and June of 2019. I think the manner in which you presided in Waterford on that occasion, Judge Igar, was courteous, respectful, and very understanding of the position of the practitioners who appeared before you. And for that, we were very grateful. On a more personal and professional note during those sessions, I had also caused to be very relieved. You heard a case in which I was counsel for the plaintiff and in which my client had rejected a rather significant PIAB assessment, which had been accepted by the defendant. And thankfully, you will no doubt appreciate and, and hopefully understand the, uh, that there was an inaudible, I hope, sigh of relief when you awarded my client somewhat in excess of that PIAB assessment. And for that again, I was very thankful on that occasion, as no doubt was my client. However, just as one swallow does not a summer make, one case does not accurately reflect or portray the attributes that characterized you as a solicitor and a judge. And mindful of paying tribute to you this morning, I did seek the advices and um, some ideas from other colleagues of mine at the bar over the past number of days. Compassion, kindness, generosity were mentioned over and over again. Together with your patience, your empathy and your understanding when dealing with criminal defence clients who had often been accused of the most egregious of crimes. I'm also told by my colleagues that you were a wonderful briefing solicitor who sent a full case to counsel, encompassing everything that counsel needed to know, nothing that counsel didn't need to know, and that you certainly didn't take the easy or, easy or lazy way out of simply sending a copy of your file. And again, I'm told by my colleagues for that, they were very, very thankful. And also that whilst mindful of counsel's advices, you were never afraid to have your own opinion, your own view of a case, and that extended to the proper, but perhaps not universally applied practice, of giving your clients the advice that they needed to hear, rather than simply the advice that they wanted to hear. But that said, I'm told that every client of yours was accorded dignity and respect, and the privilege of having you, as their solicitor, accompany them right throughout the criminal process, irrespective of the offences with which they have been charged and irrespective of their ultimate guilt or innocence. Another colleague described you to me as being unbelievably principled and a really decent person and mentioned to me that his biggest difficulty with you was that he couldn't fight or argue with you 
Because more often than not, you'd simply reply, do you know something? You're right. Pompous, you certainly weren't and are not. And I think your view of life as a solicitor was one of honour, vocation and working in the public service rather than working for financial gain. My colleagues also mentioned to me that you were incredibly considerate to appear before as a judge and as I say that is something I have one brief personal experience of. But I think the esteem in which you are held by my colleagues and by members of the profession in general is not just because of your considerate nature but also because of your humanity, your humility and your ability to treat everybody equally, irrespective of their background or where they have come from or the journey that they were undertaking. And I'm told also that in times gone by, thankfully, when perhaps it wasn't as fashionable to brief women in a criminal defence sphere, you were more than happy to brief women. And no doubt, thanks in part to you, the briefing of women is now more widespread in the criminal courts than heretofore. And that, Judge Eager, is a subject very close to my heart. But coming back to your track record in the community upon which our attorney has already touched, I think the generosity of spirit that you have shown in your dealings with the Simon community, the Irish Refugee Council, and the Ranala multi Multi-Denominational School meant that you were willing to do whatever it was, no matter how seemingly small or insignificant for those who needed help. And indeed, when acting for your clients, one of my sources mentioned to me that your commitment to your clients was such that you followed them through, maintained contact with them during and after their custodial sentences. And I think on more than one occasion, this led to you promoting the purchase of artwork by, by those former clients when some of your clients had discovered a talent for art during art therapy during their incarceration. But clients and counsel aside, I understand that you have the greatest love for your wife Monica and your daughters Katie and Sarah who are here today and no doubt they are looking forward to enjoying more of your company during your retirement. But lastly I couldn't possibly finish without touching upon your love of soccer and your support of Bohemians and Everton Football Club. And in the words of one of my colleagues, you are, as I understand it, a chronic Everton fan. <laughs> Even being given, as a birthday present, I think at one stage, an Everton t-shirt by your colleagues and Garrett Sheehan and partners. I think much to the amusement of staff on that occasion in Dohany and Nesmets, which we all know is a really very well-known soccer establishment. But perhaps in retirement, you will be able to offer Everton some practical support and guidance because I understand it, not being a soccer fan, that they clearly need some of that support and guidance <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Judge Eager, on behalf of all members of the Law Library and on my own behalf, might I wish you a most fulfilling and happy retirement. Thank you. It is my honour to be here today addressing you as President of the Law Society, a solicitor colleague, a fellow UCD alumna on the day of your retirement from the High Court in, of Ireland. There have been many highlights shared already here today of, your long and distinguished, of the long and distinguished career of the Honourable Mr Justice Eager, many of which my esteemed colleagues have outlined today. It is safe to say that the cases you've been involved in makes your career one of the most varied careers in living memory. Equally, it is also rare to, to say that any solicitor would have such a varied, distinguished and honourable career as you had. You also had a very balanced career. You started practice in the public service with the Chief State Solicitors. And then one could say you took a little turn. Perhaps one could even say you had a Robin Hood moment 
Not that anybody, Judge Eager, would visualise you uh, striding through the four courts in green tights with feathers in your hat and uh, robbing the rich to pay the poor. But rather, that great folk hero had the principles of uh, the voice for the ordinary people, for the underprivileged, the champion of their rights. From your early career at Garrett your drive to improve the criminal justice system in the public interest is immense and most commendable. Throughout your career, you constantly called out inadequate resources and championed reforms to the criminal law legislation for the benefit of the ordinary citizen. Um, Judge Eager, you have leveraged your position as an expert in criminal law and as a member of the judiciary with compassion and dignity. As a founding member of the Irish Refugee Council and chairperson of the Dublin Simon community, I've no doubt that these interests and experience will have helped you shape the judge that you are now, that you have become and that you are now. The, this compassion and dignity also are the markers of your career as a judge, presiding over cases which have been outlined by my esteemed colleagues such as asylum, human rights and equality law. You have witnessed firsthand the impact that law has on people and on society and the vital role of an independent judiciary in upholding the rule of law in the public interest. A lifelong advocate for access to justice, you've demonstrated a deep understanding of the law and the application of the rights of citizens. A friend to the law society and the solicitor's profession in the truest sense, you generously gave your time to contribute to the development of our future colleagues. Many trainees at our law school have benefited from your knowledge and guidance on criminal law during their lectures. On behalf of your colleagues and public, you have served on the Law Society Criminal Law Committee and we thank you for your commitment, time, energy and hard work. In a speech to recently qualified solicitors at a parliament ceremony in 2019, you emphasise that we must always look after our client who comes to us for advice and representation. Your words that evening, which were the privilege that is so important to the practice of solicitors is that of the client. This reminded all those in practice for many years that our focus should always be on providing access to justice. And I can tell you, Judge Eager, that this is my theme for the presidency of the Law Society this year. <coughs> Judge Eager, your commitment to access to justice has spanned the breadth of your career and indeed to this very day. And I expect that this will continue into the future. We thank you for your contribution to upholding the rule of law and improving access to justice. This passion for justice in the public interest resonates with me personally, as already stated. And I know it is a passion shared also by my colleagues across the legal landscape. It goes without saying that the Law Society is always immensely proud and encouraged when solicitors are recognized and appointed to the ranks of the judiciary. But in your appointment, we even had more pride in your glittering career on the bench. Your appointment to the High Court in 2014 was a cause of great pride. And I assure you that we will continue to advocate for more diversity amongst future judicial uh, appointments in the public interest. During a Black Hall Place ceremony, you urged your colleagues to take time out, go into nature, away from the phones, away from the emails, and I expect that this will particularly resonate with you today as you look forward to having free time to dedicate to your personal interests. Judge Eager, this is a new beginning, a new journey for you, and a new pathway. And may you have many years ahead with your, with your wife, Monica, <coughs> and Cathy, and Sarah. And we hope that getting out into nature will be an exciting phase for you. On behalf of the Law Society, on behalf of the solicitor's profession, and on my own behalf, I wish to express our pride, our gratitude to you in your committed career. And this a committed career does not occur without, easily without hard work, principles, um, and commitment. And so 
I thank you and wish you the very best for a happy and long retirement. Judge Eager, on my own behalf and on behalf of the staff of the court service, I'd very much like to associate myself with all the sentiments expressed by the earlier speakers. When I joined the civil service in the central office many, many moons ago, you were already a partner in Garrett Sheehan's office and one of the few partners in a solicitor's office whom you could just lift the phone to if there was absolutely a rare problem with bail papers on the, mad, the madness of a Wednesday afternoon. You were considered by us to be very kind, courteous and extremely knowledgeable, traits which also underpinned your work as a judge of the High Court. As a solicitor and as a judge, you've been generous with your time and your knowledge. I remember Betty saying to me, just ring Bobby there in Garrett Sheehan's, he'll, he'll explain it. And you were always so, so generous to us with your time. Um, I'd also like to thank you today for your extraordinary corporate social responsibility, if I can call it that because you always took a huge interest in the work of the court service and you were always available to help us to provide advice and to sit on committees or, or do any other work that I suppose people don't recognise that judges do along with the court service so much. Um, I spoke to my head of HR yesterday and she sat with you on numerous interview panels for judicial researchers and judicial assistants and she describes you as um, patient, generous of spirit and a gentleman of the highest order and I think we'd all agree with that. On your appointment, I think us civil servants all assumed that you'd spent most of your judicial career in the criminal courts of justice because of your career as a criminal lawyer. But since October 2014, as the attorney said, you've worked right across all of the lists in the High Court, often at very, very short notice. Kevin O'Neill and Bernard Regan are <coughs> eternally grateful for your... Um, you were always available to take work at short notice, a phone call, sorry judge, can you skip out to Clover Hill there in, for an hour's time? And you were always so obliging. I worked with you most often on the non-jury judicial review list, where you demonstrated all of those traditional values of, the pu of public service, fairness, impartiality, empathy, integrity. And again, you were always exceptionally obliging. And those values are all about serving the common good, which I think has been the, the one theme underpinning your career, whether in the private sector or in the public sector. On my own behalf and on behalf of all of the staff of the court service, I want to thank you for your unfailing kindness, understanding and courtesy in all of your dealings with us. I want to thank you for your extraordinary public service. You'll be greatly missed. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you and your family happiness and all the best for the future. I do just hope that as a member of the unofficial Four Courts Everton Supporters Club, I won't doubt the other members, you <coughs> won't spend your retirement watching them in the championship. <laughs> Good morning, Judge Eager. Uh, to you and your family that are with you today. Um, it gives me a great pleasure uh, and honour uh, to have been invited here and to thank the Register for the invitation and the opportunity to, to attend uh, this morning. Um, it's been alluded to by uh, the previous speakers of your very illustrious uh, career in the criminal justice field. And uh, on behalf of Angarda Sheikana, uh, I would like to acknowledge that contribution that you have made uh, to the criminal justice uh, system here in Ireland. Um, certainly, it goes back a long time with myself and on a personal level, um, I had many uh, cases uh, in my early days in the old Braidwell courts when you were in defence, a uh, defence lawyer. Uh, I was uh, pleased to hear uh, the Attorney General talk about he'd come out second best. And many of us as young guards would uh, uh, empathise with him in that and certainly come out second best <laughs> on many occasions when you were defending your clients. But that was just, uh, I suppose, a measure of the thoroughness, the professionalism with which you brought to defence work uh, in the district court, of which I had uh, very much experience. And all of those occasions, uh, you espoused professionalism and integrity um, towards ourselves who were out at the start of our career. And it's very much appreciated that that carried out throughout your career uh, in the court. 
uh, you, I think, uh, had empathy for people that were starting out, and many young guards uh, were at the other end of that empathy uh, in your court and indeed during your uh, time as a defence uh, uh, practice, practitioner. The contribution which you have made to the criminal justice system uh, is certainly uh, distinguished and will long last when all of us have left the playing field. Uh, that will certainly have made a significant contribution, particularly in relation to the Special Criminal Court, the Extradition Court and the High Court bails, where you have uh, shown great empathy to clients and to practitioners, and I appreciate that, as does, I'm sure, many, many members of Ingerd Sheikhana. There have been many um, descriptions a professional, empathy, uh, caring, all of those empathy, uh, is your uh, career to date. On behalf of Ingerd Sheikhana, on behalf of the Commissioner, and on my own behalf, as the Chief Superintendent here for the North Central Division, uh, which is responsibilities for the policing and security of the court. Uh, my colleague, Superintendent Jonathan O'Brien, uh, was here this morning. I want to acknowledge your, as you say, distinguished career, to congratulate you on that service, long service, public service, and to wish you, Monica, Katie and Sarah, a very long and happy retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you. and turns with participants from many different backgrounds from all walks of life. The High Court bail list is full of emotion and pressure. It's a diffi difficult area of the law and you guide it through this list with empathy and calmness, which put everyone at ease in such difficult <coughs> and sometimes traumatic circumstances. <coughs> all of us here today, sorry, excuse me, all of us here today, and I acknowledge those who are logged on in Clover Hill and in the CCJ, would agree that you were very understanding, respectful and fair in every case which you had to preside over during your very many years on the bench. The practitioners, depending on the outcome of their cases, fondly refer to you as Bobby, or some others, no be a Bobby. I like that analogy. <laughs> they always knew that they would receive a fair and unbiased hearing. I have to say, Judge, that I missed your presence when you had to briefly take leave of absence. And I was delighted when you returned to the bench until your well-deserved day of retirement today. Despite everything you had to deal with, you never failed to come onto the bench and be the excellent judge you were. Your transition to remote and video link hearings during the pandemic was flawless. In fact, you went out of your way to assist practitioners and their clients in having proper consultations online ensuring that their cases got on without any difficulties. This was done in a physical court environment during the height of the pandemic, which was a very difficult time for our judges and court staff. On a personal note, as your registrar, you left no stone unturned when it came to ensuring that we got on as many cases as possible to hearings from the very large list we had to deal with. You used your wealth of knowledge in ensuring that practitioners <laughs> adhered to bail objections and didn't prolong unnecessarily any of the hearings. That in itself, if the judges know that who we're dealing with out in the bail list, is a masterclass. So on behalf <coughs> of myself and all the registrars and staff who have the pleasure of working with you throughout your years on the bench, we wish yourself and your family all the happiness and best wishes for your well-deserved retirement. You will be missed by us all. We thank you, Judge Eager, for your service.
come back and deal with the issue of caste later. Uh, I just have a few things to say which I think are important. First of all, I want to thank primarily my wife Monica and my children Katie and Sarah for their support um, uh, while I was a solicitor and a judge. Uh, Monica is someone who is so inspiring and uh, as a psychotherapist but also as a whole lot of other things, leaders of uh, groups of people who want to change to face up to new uh, challenges. She is wonderful and I would like to commend her uh, website, which is not just a simple <laughs> website, but a very uh, intriguing website. And, uh, I'd also like to pay tribute to both Katie and Sarah. Katie, who has taken on the role of uh, working with Peter McVerry, which seems to be something that resonates with me, and Sarah, who is a wonderful English student and who's going to do extraordinarily well in university. The second thing is I'd like to thank very much the Attorney General for his remarks. Uh, I think that uh, it's a, a, a great honour for him to be uh, nominated as Attorney General. And I'm sure that having taken some time to come here today, uh, that must have already, uh, he's already knowing what uh, the amount of work that he has. Having worked at the Chief State Solicitor's Office, I operated quite closely with the Attorney General's Office so I know, have a sense of how much work he has. But I also know that uh, Rossa is a person of great experience and extreme talent, and the government are very lucky to have him. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues in the High Court including those who have been promoted to the Court of Appeal on the Supreme Court. I came from a very competitive uh, legal world as a defence solicitor. Uh, cutthroat might be a description, although that is also the client. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> but coming into the High Court, was an extremely change of, because I came to a very friendly establishment of judges, all of whom were aimed to support each other, aimed to, uh, and their friendship and collegiality, uh, which I, I, every judge in the High Court experiences. I'd like to thank all of those who, on my attempt to retire in July, sent me very warm messages, uh, and for which I'm very grateful. During that time, while I was on sick leave, uh, quite a number of people were appointed to the bench, and I'm just sorry I didn't get to know uh, more of you, but I also know that I knew many of you as appearing before me, and I uh, would like to thank you all for your, and I congratulate you on your choice of uh, paths. I served under the, as a High Court judge under four presidents, Nicholas Cairns, Peter Kelly, Mary Irvine, and now David Barnaby. And when I was first appointed, my 
my life uh, as a solicitor, which included uh, very substantial changes in the law uh, to, uh, to the asylum system, where the first couple of cases which I took, the Department of Justice said, oh yes, we signed that convention, all right, but it doesn't mean anything. And uh, so that took a bit of challenge, but successfully, eventually. And I remember myself and David Keane uh, being invited to the Department of Justice to say, well, now that you've got the right to people to have asylum, what are we to do? And I and David both said, you set up a proper system, you do it quickly, and if they fail, you throw them out. Did they do that? No. Never set up a proper system until there were 10,000 refugees in Ireland of various shapes and sizes. And eventually they managed to set up some kind of system uh, for which I had the, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, possibility of looking at how they dealt with it uh, when I was in the asylum list with Colin McYuckey, Carmel Stewart, and Mary Faherty. There was a huge backlog. We were dealing in 2014 with 2011, 2012 cases. And by the time I left the asylum list, it was down to about a year or a year and a half. So we had done a lot of work. As uh, the attorney uh, said, uh, I was appointed by the government to be the uh, supervising judge in relation to the uh, guard the surveillance of persons, and I enjoyed that. It involved getting out of the forecourts and going to the guard uh, uh, the. Um, the Felix, the guards, the surveillance unit in the Felix Park and seeing how they operated it, going to the defence forces where they told me practically very little, uh, but one or two saying that the Russians were terrible anyway. And <laughs> finally, uh, the revenue and also the last year I was, uh, my last report also included the guard, the Ombudsman Commission where they said they had nothing to report. But uh, as a result, though, of the first report I did, I said, because the guards were saying, it's taking two years, three years for a case to come before the Special Criminal Court. And I suggested that the court, the government should consider having a second Special Criminal Court. And within months, that was established and I was appointed as a judge of that second uh, special court. A after doing a number of criminal cases in 2016, uh, some of which were very, very satisfying, some of which were very demanding, and I remember in particular a child giving evidence from England with a high court judge in England and an interpreter explaining what exactly uh, he was saying, although he was very clear, I thought, in what he was saying. And in, in order to, uh, to ease his pressure, I said, and what football team do you support? And he said, Manchester United. And I said, well, look, I support Everton. And he laughed. <laughs> so, <laughs> Such is the appropriate response. <laughs> that case was, it took a long time. And it, I think I understood at that stage the importance of a balanced jury because the chairperson of the jury used to say to me on a Monday, oh, do you mind if we take off Friday? Because one of, my, one of the judges 
or one of the jurymen has a, an operation or a medical procedure or whatever. I mean, it was, that was the thing that you needed to get rather than anything else. Um, and then I spent about two years doing judicial review work under Seamus Newton. And uh, I really found, I think, that in hindsight, some of my best judgments were in judicial review. Uh, and uh, I, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity of doing judicial review work. At that stage, then, I was appointed to the bail list, and I suppose that was the most satisfying uh, time as, of a, as a judge. It was as uh, the, <clears throat> the lists were extraordinary, and uh, as both Caroline uh, Murray has said, and Kevin would say as well, you had a, a, a situation where if you were lucky, you had 40 cases, and if you were unlucky, you had more than 50 cases to deal with <laughs> in the bail list. And very rarely would anyone uh, agree to the... Uh, so it was a very hard-working, but most satisfying. Uh, and it was very much, as uh, Caroline has said, an emotionally charged court. Uh, with and uh, the and in my uh, view, the barristers and solicitors who who appeared in that list provided a very professional and a very uh, admirable uh, approach to those cases. I had started working as a a solicitor in, in 1998 uh, as a solicitor in the uh, Chief State Solicitor's Office. And uh, it was a time of very satisfying work. Peter Sutherland was the Attorney General, and I remember having one case where uh, I was prosecuting the Irish Independent on the then editor of the Irish Independent for a breach of the Official Secrets Act. This was the only successful uh, conviction of anyone involved in the kidnap of Shergar, and their breach of the Official Secrets Act was that they had published a photograph from uh, a private guard the source and so they were, and they had they, uh, the, the, the two very eminent uh, senior and junior counsel, including Kevin Feedy, who was the junior, the late Kevin Feedy, uh, appeared. And uh, the district judge started off and set the tone by calling me Bobby. <laughs> now, that was a very bad sign, really. And then she convicted us. And then on appeal, we went before, uh, oh, sorry, uh, but a man who was few words and little law. And uh, he, uh, his, most, most of his judgments were convict, convict. And uh, that was what happened to the Irish Independent. <laughs> I knew that uh, there was mention of the number of judges who are appointed as solicitors. And while there have been a number more after me, uh, and uh, I mentioned in particular Michael Toby, Eileen Creedon, Michael Quinn, Mark Heslin, and Eileen Roberts. It's a very small number of solicitors who've been appointed 
just compared to the number of barristers. That's not to say that uh, the barristers who have been appointed have been excellent. And, uh, but I do think that if you look at the contribution of solicitors to the High Court bench, it speaks for itself. And I would call on the Judicial Appointments Commission and the uh, government to consider more solicitors. I would like to thank particularly those of, of you who became, of the judges who became close friends of mine. And I include in particular John Jordan, Tody O'Connor, Paul Coffey, and Mary Rose Geerty. I look forward to having breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, with you in the future. And, uh, uh, and I also would like to thank the various people who, uh, who have been close to me, both in terms of location as well as uh, uh, as well as in the same field. I'd like, first of all, then, to mention and to thank Angela Denning for her contribution today and to all the members of the court service who have stood by me as a solicitor, as a judge, and who were wonderful in every aspect, and for whom the courts couldn't operate. Uh, I always remember Angela as being the uh, registrar at the, uh, at the non-jury uh, non judicial review section. And in my practice, uh, where I was appearing for persons charged with sexual offences, and trying to kick the case back for as long as possible. I have to say that uh, it was very easy to do it because I was so pleasant. Uh, and Angela was a very wise person in not shoving in a case like that before uh, uh, the judge. I'd also like to thank very much the Judicial Support Unit, and in particular, Audrey Mohan and Alicia Darcy, who very kindly rang me this morning to say she was thinking of me. That was Alicia's mothering role was very good for all of, our, all of us as judges. I'd also like to thank in particular, Kevin O'Neill and Bernard Regan, and all the registrars who uh, attended at hearings. I'm very grateful for their support and wisdom and pointing me in the right direction. Uh, and in sorting the list. They've all been very kind to me as a judge and uh, not intolerant, as one might expect, because of my fumbling. Or, uh, I'm very grateful for the comments that have been passed on me in relation to my uh, work, both as a solicitor and as a High Court judge. My work, my, I remember when I first worked with Garrett, she and Garrett would say, almost like the Psalms, we walk in the valley with the client. And I always brought that to my practice, that I walked through the valley of sin to judgment day. And, uh, and I also see a number of very uh, loyal and uh, Barrister, senior counsel, who would always act in cases where I really required that kind of action. Um, 
I am funnily enough, I always remember Remy Farrell uh, coming down to Waterford uh, in a, the back of a small car. And Remy is, if we might say, a well-built man. <laughs> and he didn't have much chance. But those were the kind of cases that were wonderful. They were really uh, important cases. And I also did spend the last 15 years re re representing priests, representing brothers, and other religious. Uh, and I found that very, very satisfying. I think you get to know someone who's charged with a sexual offence in a different way, maybe a more compassionate way than society would see them. And I did walk through that valley with them as far as I could. I think that in future, the next few years are going to be very challenging for Ireland and for the world. And uh, I, with climate change, with housing, refugees, and the wars that are taking place, uh, and uh, one of the great benefits I ha have had for the last few years has been to start meditating with the help of Eckhart Tolle and others of, about the power of the present time rather than be worried about the past, although that's what I'm looking at at the moment, but also the future. But to think about the present moment the tree, looking at the tree, looking at the sea, sitting down and enjoying the sun, but the present moment, and not be worrying about anything. I remember asking Peter Kelly at one stage, trembling a bit in my boots, that I was going to go to a meditation conference in London and uh, expecting P P Peter to say, well, now I think Mass would be far better. <laughs> he, had, he in fact said it was a great idea and that a friend of his had been trying to get him to go to the Buddhist Centre in Kerry, in Dogshin Berra. Truly, that was the support of, from a man who had great faith. So finally, I would like to thank all of you who spoke today and all the people who are here today. And I look forward myself to doing plenty of reading, some writing. Uh, you all tremble immediately when you hear that. And, uh, uh, and uh, maybe just some travel. I think that's what I would look forward to. So thank you all very much.